Hello, everybody. A big welcome to all of you in the UK and those joining from around the world uh, for our latest uh, edition of the Saping Care Group webinars, the first of 2021. Um, the subject of today's webinar has been stimulated by a number of emails from GPs we've been getting about the wide umbrella term <clears throat> for the post-viral uh, long-term illness called long COVID or COVID long haulers, as they say in the States. Um, which encompasses a wide myriad of symptoms and signs. Uh, the data suggests that uh, initially it was 5% of COVID sufferers will have residual symptoms at three months, but the latest data is suggesting that it's more like 10 uh, who are having symptoms of some level at three months. Um, so I also must confess uh, a personal interest in this topic as just before Christmas, I myself got sick with respiratory symptoms and I got tested and unfortunately I was COVID positive and after a relatively indolent acute illness I started getting some very strange symptoms after two weeks uh, mainly persistent shortness of breath severe lethargy and some bizarre neurological symptoms of uh, delirium paranoia and some confusion which thankfully only uh, subsided after two days so I myself I'm very interested to understand why and whether I had autoantibodies crossing my blood brain barrier uh, <clears throat> causing these effects. Um, so finally, I now have the uh, pleasure as always of passing on uh, uh, to our chairman, Professor Stafford Lightman. Um, he may come across as a mild mannered and humble uh, gentleman, but let me assure you, he is an absolute giant in his field a very shortened, condensed CV prof. Uh, he's the professor of medicine at University of Bristol since 1993, a consultant neuroendocrinologist, immediate past president of the British Neuroscience Association and a fellow of the Royal Society. And that's a very, very shortened version of the CV. Thank you, Professor Stafford, for, uh, Stafford uh, Lightman for being our chairman uh, for the nine webinars that we did through 2020 and your ongoing support and guidance. We are extremely fortunate to have you on board. So I'll pass you over, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Sanjeev. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's Sapien Care webinar. Long COVID is a life-changing topic for many people throughout the world. Although at the moment, both the health services and the government are concentrating on the treatment of acute COVID, the prevalence of long COVID is slowly increasing and threatens to put yet more pressure on our hard-pressed healthcare provision. Long COVID can present with a variety of debilitating symptoms, such as breathlessness, chest pain, palpitations, and orthostatic intolerance. And these can last for weeks or even months, even following mild illness. It's been suggested that this is a collection of at least four distinct clinical entities, uh, including post-intensive care syndrome, post-viral fatigue syndrome, permanent organ damage, and long-term COVID-19 syndrome. Clearly, we need a much clearer view of how to diagnose the real long COVID, to get a, candle, to get a handle on its pathophysiology, and to come up with a pathway for the diagnosis and management of affected patients. So to this end, we've invited four panel members with experience in intensive care, clinical immunology, and primary care to help us find a path through this maze. So our first speaker is Hugh Montgomery, and Hugh is Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at University College London, where he also directs the Centre for Human Health and Performance. He still spends 25% of his time working in the North London Intensive Care Unit. Interestingly, he actually discovered an allele of the gene with the DNA code for angiotensin converting enzyme, which influenced his physical fitness. And of course, this is the docking receptor for COVID-19. So Hugh, can I start by asking you about your experience and what you think is long COVID? Hugh. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. Um, the, the simple answer is, which I'll start from the beginning, is that I don't know what it is. And I challenge anyone else to tell me that they do either. What I do know is that it's real. And so this is perhaps um, interesting in itself because it's the first disease of the modern time that patients have defined. Uh, if we go back to February, March, the WHO China Working Group was saying that this uh, COVID was a disease that was basically over in two weeks with mild disease, maybe three to four weeks if you were severely affected. 
And then patients in the early part of spring started reporting online saying, well, hang on, this isn't right. I've got symptoms that went away and have now come back in a different form. And sometimes we're even undulating. Um, Facebook groups started appearing of aggregating those data. Um, the first hashtag appeared out of Lombardy in Italy with long COVID. So this was a patient defined and named disease. Um, and since then, as you know, symptoms have been collected. So we know that it's real. We know that it affects probably one, at best, one in 20 people at around eight weeks and one in 50, so maybe 2.4% at, at beyond eight to 12 weeks. And we know that there are at least 50 symptoms that patients report, but they tend to fall into two clusters. There's the commonest one, which is sort of HERF, that's headache, upper respiratory symptoms and fatigue, particularly exertional fatigue and muscle aches. And then there's another grouping which you could generally put into more uh, multi-system type pattern. Now, the problem we've got at the moment is that we're being told that we should be setting up rehabilitation centres for this disease. But if I was to ring you up Stafford and say, look, Stafford, go, go, go. I want you to set up a rehab centre. And you said, yeah, that's good. Hugh, what am I rehabilitating? Is it broken ankles? Is it people post hip replacement? Is it after a heart attack or traumatic brain injury? Or is it someone with COPD? And I said, uh, don't, don't know. You would probably say, well, I don't know how to intervene in that case at all. And that's the situation we're in here. So these symptoms could come from a raft of different places. So the first is, as you mentioned, the ACE2 receptor is the receptor that the spike protein of the virus docks to to get into cells. And that receptor is very ubiquitously expressed. It's in the um, cells surrounding your factory lobe and the olfactory nerve, which causes this loss of sense of smell. It's in the pharynx and the upper airway and the lung tissue itself. But it's probably in brain cells. It's found in the thyroid gland, in the pancreas. It's most expressed in the testes in adult men. It's expressed in the vagina, the placenta, and the uterus and fallopian tubes in women. It's found in skeletal muscle, liver, proximal convoluted tubular kidney. So this virus is getting in and attacking all of those tissues acutely. Now on intensive care, we see that. We see bad lungs, but in wave one, 26% of the time the kidneys went down. People universally had high muscle inflammatory markers. They had signs of heart injury. So we could see, and indeed liver, we could see all these disease uh, organs being affected. But what then happens isn't really known. You could say, well, some people have got some chronic low grade expression of the virus in some of those tissues. No evidence for that yet, but it's possible. Um, it could be that you've caused end organ damage, which is persisting. So let's think of the breathlessness and fatigue. That could be the lung but it could be that you've got small blood clots in the small vessels of the lung, that you've got giant sized blood clots in the big blood vessels. And indeed one of my colleagues had that. It could be that you've got bronchiolitis of the litterans organizing pneumonia. It could be that you've got fibrosis. It could be you've got a secondary lung infection. All of those would call you to be breathless as would impairment of your heart function or abnormal heart rhythms. Or it could be that it's actually skeletal muscle and we have some very good evidence now that mitochondria are being directly affected here. The cellular powerhouses are having oxygen phosphorylation knocked out, which is rendering people who would otherwise be very fit, breathless on very low grade exertion because they're producing lactic acid at low thresholds as well. So it could be any or all of those. Um, the brain is involved, is that directly? Possibly it is, the virus affecting the brain. Is it inflammation in the brain? Could it be in fact from the gut? We know that ACE2 regulates the gut microbiome. It affects uptake of tryptophan, which is the precursor of serotonin. Um, obviously a major regulator is a neurotransmitter of mood. So all of these things are possible. And if you measure and go looking for abnormalities in those systems, you'll find a lot of them there. And I won't steal thunder from our next speaker because he knows far more about it than I. But of course, if you, uh, there's a lot of potential for autoimmune disease. Um, firstly, if you expose an awful lot of tissue antigens to your own immune system because you're leathering all those organs at once, there's a lot of prospect for your body to abreact. But secondly, we know that all but three of the epitopes on the coronavirus itself cross-react uh, with human antigens. 
So you could be making autoantibodies in an effort to attack the virus itself. So that's a very long winded way of saying, I really don't have a clue, but I think we have to start taking this, taking the conventional approach that we would otherwise take, which is if you came to me saying, Hugh, I'm breathless and I find I can't walk very far without things aching, then I, that's, that's a clinical problem that all of us clinicians here would know how to address. We'd know what to start looking for and we'd start defining it and making those diagnoses. And we do need to do that. And we need to start scoping things that we otherwise wouldn't look for. I, I've, if you go to the online groups, for instance, women are reporting a lot, very commonly menstrual cycle disorders. They're not getting to see their GPs very often about those. Sometimes they're told, well, that's what happens if you get poorly or if you're a bit stressed. But there's only been one paper so far looking at testosterone levels, for instance, in men, and that paper wasn't good enough to really consider the data from. But we don't even know if those are affected. We don't know, for instance, if the adrenal axis is affected, we know on CT scans that 24% of people on intensive care have clear coronavirus involvement of their adrenals. And we know that at post-mortem, there's involvement as well. But we don't yet know whether we've got lots of patients who are tired because um, their adrenal axis is suppressed. So um, anyway, I've witted on for ages saying I really don't know what I'm talking about. But then I'm not sure anyone else does either. Okay, you, but you asked me right at the very beginning that you were going to suggest I open the clinic. Yes. And so I've got my clinic there and a, the first patient comes in and uh, says, have I got post-viral fatigue or have I got long COVID? What, what do you do? Well, the, the first thing is I have to say that uh, when we're talking about post-viral fatigue syndromes and ME and so forth, I've never been sure that we know what that pathophysiology oh. is either. So I think that's a very convenient way of doctors chucking things into a dustbin. Yep, I agree. And, and not looking. Um, so I'd want you to look if I came to your clinic and I'd want you to listen to me and do the relevant tests. So we've stumbled on this mitochondrial effect, for instance, um, because we just asked people to do a six minute walk test. That's easily done in a clinic. And we found that they couldn't walk very far. And furthermore, when we measured their blood lactate, we found that for quite a lot of them, it had gone through the roof, even with six minutes of walking, when they were previously fit, young, healthy people. So that's given us a clue that at least some of those people, it's that. But um, to my mind, I would go down, which group are they in? If it's the fatigue muscle ache side, then I think you've got to see if there's a respiratory or cardiac component. Um, if we get tests open for like cardiopulmonary exercise testing, then that's pretty much a one-stop shop. You can get evidence of impaired cardiac contractility or high pulmonary artery pressures. You can look for exertional desaturation. You can look at ventilatory efficiencies for oxygen, carbon dioxide. So as a test, that's an excellent test. Um, but then I would go further down that mill. And if you've got, a, for instance, a low lactate threshold, I'd investigate appropriately. Um, I can't tell you what that will show. We're only just starting to do the muscle biopsies and things now, but um, we do know from other groups that, that some of those are, are, are profoundly abnormal. Well, thanks to you. I think this is a good time to bring Petter in because we can then discuss this uh, in more detail a bit later about how all the different groups uh, need to be able to be aware of what the situation is and mm. what they have uh, in their toolkit to investigate people. But of course, one of the first things we need to do is, is actually to understand a little bit more about the disease itself. So uh, Petter, uh, Petter Broden is Professor of Pediatric Immunology at Science for the, at the Science for Life Laboratory in the Karolinska Institute, and he's consultant in pediatric immunology at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. His team you know, develops experimental and computational tools for system level analysis of the human immune systems, both in health and in disease, and he has a particular interest in long COVID. So, Petter, can I start by just asking you what you feel uh, is long COVID? and how we might be able to differentiate it from other diseases associated with fatigue. Thank you, yes, very, very. Um, thanks for that introduction and, and the question. Yes, I think, uh, first of all, I wanna continue where Hugh uh, left off. I think uh, we first have to just sort of group patients into different groups, depending on the presentations that they have. And I would like to add that there is one group that has had a pretty severe acute infection and then have sequelae from that acute infection, whether it's organ damage and so on. Um, but in our 
clinic where I collaborate with the adult clinics here, we distinguish the patients that have been treated in hospitals for their acute COVID versus the ones that were not. And these are profoundly different groups of individuals that present with long-term symptoms. Um, in the hospital-treated group with severe acute infection, they're predominantly males and they're older. Uh, and in the other group, they're predominantly women. And so I think, uh, at least from what I'm understanding now, in terms of the subgroups of patients, is that there is one with a lung dominating symptoms of the lung, another one which has profound dysautonomic symptoms, which uh, we, we can get into the details of that in a little bit. Um, there is a heart group that has myocarditis and those sort of things. And then there's a more of a neurological subgroup from, from what I understand, which have fatigue predominantly. And so I don't think there's necessarily one condition. There might be common pathways to these different presentations, but they're not one disease in my opinion. So uh, you, you think these are, these are different subgroups and you'll need specialist clinics for uh, specific diseases, is that, is that what you have in mind? Well, we, what we are doing in Stockholm at the moment, which I think works fairly well, but it might not scale, it might, might not be possible in every hospital, you know, is to have a multi-professional assessment of every patient. And then, um, as Hugh mentioned, do a walk test, do a dual energy CT scans to look at perfusion and ventilation of the lung in those patients that have predominantly lung symptoms. Obviously, have cardiologists assess the heart of the patients with heart symptoms, and then immunolo immunological workup in all of our patients uh, to assess autoantibodies, evidence of persistent immune activation, um, responses to the virus, whether the patients have seroconverted or not, and so on and so forth. So I do think a multidisciplinary approach is required, at least in the beginning, as we are trying to understand this condition better. That's going to be very expensive on doctors, isn't it? That's a, a lot of a lot of time for very tired doctors at the present time. Can I, can I ask, um, one thing you mentioned was that uh, there's a big difference between males and females. That, yeah. That's sort of fairly amazing. Does that give you a handle on to anything in terms of the biological mechanisms that's going on? I believe so. I don't have data to prove that at the moment, but that's one of the things we're very interested in. We do know that the immune response to the virus early on differs profoundly between men and women. And we think that this is one reason why males are more are overrepresented in severe disease, developing severe disease. We also know from before COVID that vaccine responses, for example, is more efficient in women than in men. Women tend to have a stronger vaccine response than men. And we know that survival for many infectious diseases are higher in women than in men, even in the very young age, such as in newborns. And so I do believe that the early immune response sets an individual onto a path of either, you know, um, cleared infection and perhaps higher risk of long COVID in females or a higher risk of severe acute illness in males. And while you're mentioning this, is there evidence that patients for it getting severe COVID are different from those who get long COVID after mild disease? Yes, uh, they seem to be different groups in, in, as far as I understand. And, and um, I do believe that this traces back to the initial immune response to the virus that determines your trajectory, so to speak. Well, one, one of the things that I read recently, which absolutely fascinated me, uh, was uh, a, a paper in Nature, I think it's a couple of weeks ago, that wasn't actually looking at, uh, uh, at COVID, but was looking at survivors of Ebola. And right. people who survive from uh, uh, survive Ebola can still be getting uh, periodic uh, production of antibodies for a long period afterwards. So they come and they go and they come and they go, suggesting that there's recurrence of viral viruses which are surviving in immune privileged sites. I mean, is, is this one of the other possibilities that patients with long COVID still have COVID? It's just somewhere where it's silent and then comes out again. 
I think that's definitely possible. And there's actually a paper also in Nature from the Michel Nussensweig's lab at the Rockefeller in New York showing very recently that um, patients months out from their acute COVID actually do have evidence of viral particles in the intestine, um, even though they are long uh, since testing ne negative in their uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. So do, do we actually know whether uh, people with long COVID, if they're immunized, so they have an, uh, presumably another large bout of antibodies and uh, T cell responses, does that actually change their, improve their long COVID or change, change their symptoms in any way? Well, I don't think we know um, definitely, but uh, there is a lot of concern among the patient groups, as far as I'm understanding, online and so on in these discussions that are going on. There, a lot of people are very concerned about this. I do know a few cases of patients who have gotten worse after uh, encountering the virus a second time. Um, and so it is possible that this triggers a worsening of symptoms again, but I think we, it remains to be seen in more larger material. Well, thanks, mate. We will, we'll come back to, I'm sure we'll come back to general discussions around this a bit later, but uh, if I can, what I'd like to do now is to, uh, bring in Stephanie De Giorgio, uh, who I'm very pleased to see here because she actually only finished work at five o'clock today. So, so if she's looking a bit hot and bothered, which she doesn't seem to be, it uh, would be because she'd been running really fast back, which uh, actually probably is something she doesn't want to do. Anyway, Stephanie is a portfolio GP in Kent with an interest in women's health. Uh, she's perinatal mental health national clinical lead and advisor to NHS England. And she also actually runs Resilient GP, which is an online peer support and education forum she co-founded to support primary care staff. So uh, with this background, uh, she has actually uh, developed long COVID herself and has personal experience of the failure of people to understand what the patient is actually undergoing. I think this is really a very, very important area. And I wonder, Stephanie, if you could just tell us about your experience with long COVID and what it's actually like living with it. Yeah, um, thank you for having me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to explain a little bit. Um, I, so I got COVID last March, um, obviously no testing at the time. Um, I didn't have a huge cough, um, but my sats, I was desaturating. I was one of those happy hypoxics, as they say, um, and intense fatigue. So I, it's been nearly a year. Um, my symptoms, it's been really interesting listening to your previous speakers, actually. Um, I tend to uh, get horrible fatigue and the fatigue, interestingly, is caused as much by mental activity as physical activity. They, they are as, as, almost as bad as each other. Um, I've had a persistent fever, so I've had a fever probably three out of seven days for a year, nearly. Um, generally up to about 37.7, interestingly, significantly higher since I had my vaccine, which has interested me. Um, horrible brain fog, like, sort of like in those first days after a baby when your brain is mushed. Um, it's like that, it's, you know, I, I write academic stuff, what would take me an hour takes me three days, um, really hard to do. And, and I have to have a good day to do it. I'm still tachycardic and I um, become quite short of breath, but mostly due to a tachycardia. Hormonal changes, big hormonal changes. I've started HRT. Um, and my daughter, interestingly, has also suffered. She's nine. Um, she wasn't very poorly at the time, um, but she gets intense bouts of fatigue that last a couple of days, um, if not a week sometimes struggles with school, um, can't concentrate at all. And she's not, you know, she's not making it up. It's real, she goes very pale, she looks unwell. So it's been rubbish, actually. I'm self-employed, if I don't work, I don't get paid. Um, so, and I've had to give up my job presenting, uh, sitting, talking to a computer, I find really hard. I still see patients all the time, um, but I'll have a day at work and then need a day in bed often still. And that's a year on. So it's it's pretty grim, actually. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. Stephanie, can I just ask you, without it, without any specifics, uh, of how you find your colleagues and other people react to this, whether they actually understand what you're going through? It's really mixed. I'd say medics have never been very good with 
post viral things. I think as your previous speaker, I think it was Hugh said they tend to label them into a little box yeah. and, and say we can't explain it. Um, some people say, oh, well, you didn't have a test, so we can't know it's COVID. I've had people say, <laughs> had people diagnose me with all sorts of weird things. I think I told you I had ch chicken goo or was that? Chicken I goo anywhere. Yes. I've literally <laughs> that is Margate. an amazing diagnosis. <laughs> yes. I've been in Margate. This is not <laughs> happening. Um, <laughs> and um, I haven't had anyone tell me I'm making it up, but I have had people, I, I had to go to hospital probably when I have March, so September, because I was feeling so poorly. And trying to tell the story and to get people to get it was, was actually quite hard. And these are people I work with. These are people who know what I'm like on a, you know, in my normal life. They know how I function. Um, and they didn't get it. That's, that's really, really important. And, and, and what's, what this is going to do is uh, basically people like you uh, are going to be presenting uh, a lot to general practice. So perhaps I could now move on to our, our primary care specialist who regular attendees at Sapien Care webinars will know very well, who's Rog Roger H Henderson. Roger, I, I think we've established now that uh, long COVID is a reality and it's one that's going to be presenting to GPs up and down the country. And the question that I'd like to ask you is, are we prepared for it? Uh, how far? I think the government's giving £10 million or something towards long COVID. But with the NHS on the verge of cracking, massive backlogs from other patients whose treatments have been delayed, how can we shoehorn long COVID into existing cardiac or pulmonary rehabilitation? I mean, it's I'm almost as if Sorry. we're going to need a, a separate long COVID NHS. Exactly right. This is my biggest fear, uh, that we're trying to shoehorn a pint and a half into a pint NHS Pot. And I'd almost go back one step there, Hugh, and say, where does general practice currently find itself now? Now, the burden of non-COVID ill health has just exploded. Routine services are suspended, patients avoiding outpatients, A&E, uh, and even, even GPs. And if you go back a year, the number of patients waiting more than a year for routine care, the so-called long wait, is 100 times more than pre-COVID, the highest since 2008. In fact, and you know, back of a number of calculations, four to five years to clear that, it's probably a fair calculation. Now, smaller practices, especially, we've got workforce workforce shortages, staff fall sick, they've got a shield, they've got to um, intermittently self isolate, and I think the practice team burnout is a real risk in the months and years to come with with with, with staff leaving. Um, we've touched on actually what long COVID might and might not. B, and it goes without saying that this is going to be about one of our most significant workloads in primary care for, for months and years to come. But unlike almost the rest of our work, we're going to be managing long COVID patients with no formal diagnosis, with no formal treatment, and with no formal prognosis. And that's going to be a slightly spooky place for many GPs to be in. So to manage these patients that in the main are going to be dealt with in primary care, we're going to have to, in, we're going to, have to assess and manage their comorbidities. We're going to have to provide information to them about social, financial, and cultural support. This is real holistic stuff. We're going to have to safety net them. We're going to have to provide mental health support, both in the surgery and in the community. And touching on what Stephanie said, this has all got to be and this is my main message from the wayside pulpit for, pulpit for primary care on a background of empathy, of reassurance and honesty. I'm old enough to still remember the 1980s yuppie flu and, and the derogatory term that, that was often used by health professionals as, as, as well. And we've come a long way since then, but as Stephanie says, it is still patchy, but most GPs know about post-viral syndromes. The three big symptoms I'm seeing at the moment in long COVID patients are the fatigue, uh, as Stephanie says, the myalgia and the exertional dyspnea, but the autonomic dysregulation symptoms, you know, the postural orthostatic tachycardia, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, the abnormal thermoregulation, the gut and the skin manifestations. Um, and I think a lot of these do overlap with symptoms of my myalgic encephalomyelitis and, you know, the immune activation and the infection that triggers that. There's a lot of work to be done there. Now, conventionally, you've got a patient coming in with a set of symptoms, and we then 
in, uh, examine them and investigate them. The problem with long COVID is for the majority of our long COVID patients, investigations are all likely to be negative. Now they can be used to help try and pinpoint cause of ongoing symptoms. And obviously we don't want to miss new hypothyroids, new type two diabetics. But in the main, we're not going to be able to rely on trusted investigations to help us out of a long COVID diagnostic hole. Now, certainly um, inflammatory markers can help with things like PEs and myocarditis, obviously. And we mustn't forget ferritin, you know, for inflammatory and prothrombotic states. And so we're going to be referring to secondary care colleagues, you know, respiratory, cardiology and neurologically. Um, but most of the time we're going to be managing long COVID in primary care. So it's going to be a two-way street. We're going to have to refer medically and there's going to have to be self-care. The medical stuff ranges from the really symptom, the symptomatic, you take paracetamol for a temperature. But we're going to have to be very careful to control the comorbidities of our diabetics, of our COPD patients, of our ischemic heart disease patients, which for the last year may well have worsened on the back of not coming in to see us, we're going to have to perhaps have a lower threshold for treating secondary infections. We're going to have to treat specific complications as required, but um, monitoring functional status in long COVID isn't any kind of exact science yet. We're learning as we go along. And we have touched on this, and I think many GPs haven't realized this. At the moment, it does seem the biggest group of long COVID patients is women in their early 50s. And some early data does suggest there may well be a link to low estradiol and testosterone levels. And I have spoken to some HRT specialists and gynecologists who have treated long COVID patients in that category with hormone supplementation and who have reported significant improvement or to, almost to the point of recovery. So we mustn't forget little snippets like that. Listening and empathy is absolutely crucial. And we talked about the physical in, in the main so far, mental health is going to be a huge tidal wave coming our way in primary care, not only for adults, but for children. You know, the current estimates, there are half a million children uh, who now need support, uh, who didn't have any diagnosed mental health problems pre-pandemic. Uh, we've got to um, av avoid inappropriate medicalization uh, of, of our mental health patients with long COVID. We must resist the temptation to reach for our prescription pad. Um, and we've got to ensure longer appointments in primary care if they're required. There's no way around that one. And the reason we should do all that is if a patient feels abandoned and left their own devices, they then toddle off to the medical textbook called Facebook, which is not a great place to get the information uh, from in places like this. So they should be having daily pulse oximeter. They should all be given a pulse oximeter. You know, they should be looking at 96% plus SATs uh, on a daily basis, rest and relaxation, obviously, and the general advice about diet and alcohol and smoking, uh, caffeine and sleep. And the gradual increase in exercise and self-pacing is, is a message that is almost automatically put out. I'd be very wary. This is contentious. If it's tolerated, that is fine. There are large numbers of patients with long COVID already who are saying, if I try and push myself, I'm just going backwards. We must not use that as a mantra in primary care. And above all, we've got to be honest and give realistic targets and timescales, even if we don't know exactly what those are. Being overly optimistic with patients in primary care will come back to bite us. Otherwise, we're going to end up being like the Prime Minister, giving unrealistically optimistic messages, and that then leads to disappointments and lack of trust. So I suppose there are five pillars that I would sort of hang my primary care um, advice on. And in a particular order, um, I would say we've got to listen to our patients. First of all, we've got to understand their concerns. We've got to validate their experiences and we've got to manage their symptoms and their comorbidities. If we have to refer, we refer. So that we've got, we've got form on this, the slowly evolving knowledge of, of other poorly understood conditions such as chronic pain and functional disorders has proved to us the risk for patients who feel that their symptoms are being diminished or ignored. And without clear acknowledgement of long COVID, honest communication, and careful patient-centered research, which is happening, patients do face unsatisfactory 
unsatisfactory outcomes in long COVID, and we mustn't uh, mis make those mistakes again. Secondly, discharged patients must have long-term access to multidisciplinary healthcare, including rehab services uh, and telehealth, as well as social and financial support packages where available. Um, young adults um, are affected by both COVID and long COVID, so we've got to still have effective public health um, messages for those young adults about the risks of infection that is still warranted. Fourth, primary care must be given the capacity to deal with patients with long COVID. That is a very short sentence with a very, very long tail. And that feeds into what we were saying right at the start about almost having a separate NHS for long COVID. I mean, there's 10 million pounds being sunk into 69 long COVID clinics at the moment. I mean, really add a naught to that. And then over the next four to five years, you might want to add another naught to that. If you do try and put 180,000 patients at current estimates, squeezed into an NHS which is already on its knees, it's just not going to work. And it's just going to log jam everything even more. And finally, healthcare workers themselves, we're likely to have a high burden of long COVID. And so we've got to have adequate occupational health provision. So those are my sort of messages from the wayside pulpit, but being honest with patients, being empathetic and reassuring to patients, not giving them false promises, and referring as and when is necessary are probably where we have to be working from right at the start in primary care. Bearing in mind, we've got to do everything we can to stop patients becoming either a revolving door patient where we, we start to get heart sink symptoms, you know, in GPs, the last thing that long COVID patients must become is any kind of heart sink patients. And I think sort of Stephanie may have had some experience about that with her, with her medical colleagues. So from pri a primary care point of view, um, that's where we're going to come from. But it behoves every GP to have in their head uh, 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 their own little pathways as to what they do when those patients walk through their door. And the one thing I can absolutely guarantee we're going to get patients coming in through our doors every day. I'm a little worried about every single GP rediscovering the wheel. And obviously a part, a part of this is because we just don't understand what we're looking at. And I'm going to want to explore a little bit more what, uh, uh, what investigations or, or what needs to be done to actually find out a bit more about this disease. But just before I do that, for, for completeness, since we... Uh, actually have a paediatrician on the panel. Uh, I think it would be really helpful, Peter. Could you tell us a little bit about paediatric inflammatory multi-system multi syndrome? Because, I mean, I know it's quite rare, but it does happen to children. Uh, and, and it's particularly interesting that about 75% of them seem to be BAME, uh, BAME, BAME patients. Can you, could you tell us a bit more about it? So oh, yeah, thank you. That's uh, it, it is a rare condition. Uh, we think it affects maybe one to ten thousand, maybe one to even a hundred thousand of all infected children. The trick is we don't know how many children have been infected to date, so it's hard to estimate. But um, and it's a variable presentation. Some are severely ill in shock at the A and E and need to go straight to the ITU, um, even ECMO in some cases due to a multi-organ failure. In related to the hyperinflammatory syndrome. But what I think is interesting for today's discussion is also the fact that the timing of this condition is actually quite interesting. It, it sort of develops one to two months after the initial infection. And if you think about the analogy with the long presentation or long COVID, I think there are some overlapping mechanisms here. And that's one of the things that we are actually studying at the moment. Uh, so if you think of a dysregulated initial immune response to the virus, triggering this condition down the line when the adaptive immune system has sort of activated itself to a certain point. Um, you could see some similarities there with the long COVID, actually. And so uh, I think that is an interesting, uh, an interesting thought to keep in mind. Thanks. We've got a lot. Of, we have a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. Before, before I go through all of these, I wonder if I could ask both uh, Hugh and Petro, in fact, any of you, uh, what you think we 
need to, to design in order to study the subjects, the patients who are coming through, that's going to help us understand what's going on better so that we can improve the way that we manage them? Maybe you can start with you. Right, so I'm, it's the old Irish proverb, I wouldn't start from here. Um, I wouldn't have put the money into rehabilitation clinics at that scale without knowing what the disease is. So what I'd have done is deep phenotypes, and that's what I'd like to do, if we can get the money together, to deep phenotype many hundreds of patients and throw the book at all of them. So get the inflammasome, the immunome worked out, look at the epigenetic effects, look at lungs, heart, brain, muscle, get, get everything there, and then define uh, the subphenotype. Because as Petter pointed out, you can get to the same clinical endpoint through a multitude of different pathways. And the way you treat that clinical endpoint will therefore differ. So we do need to understand whether the clinical clustering is the same as the pathogenic clustering. We then need to work out what's the most parsimonious way of investigating those. Because to take Roger's point, um, we, we, this is conventional health systems won't work here. Roger can't possibly refer every patient piecemeal to a cardiologist say, oh, it's not the heart, to a pulmonologist who says it's not that, to an imaging person who says it's not that. To, that would take forever and it'd be, it'd be wholly unsatisfactory for the patient and everyone else and probably very slow and wasteful. What we need to do is having defined these subphenotypes to get the biomarker for a cluster that informs everything else. If you have this, then you have the following as well. So we need that to be as parsimonious as possible. And while we're doing that, we need to work out ways by talking from our end in hospitals to people like Roger to work out how we change the way of practicing medicine so that Roger isn't left with a patient who feels helpless, where he feels helpless because he doesn't know what tests to run or what to do. And we need, of course, to collect all those data and connect them to pharmaceutical industry, because if we are going to look for cures rather than a, a sympathetic hand and a sympathetic ear, then we're going to need to connect those data to the people who might be able to do something about it. Um, but I hear everything that others have said. We can't be complacent about this. This is large numbers of people. And we've already heard from a patient just now. It, it's heartbreaking to hear someone so many months down the line whose life is disrupted to that degree. And that's an underestimate of those impacts, I suspect. I think on the back of that here, if I may, I mean, conventionally, we think of you refer or you don't. I think what we should be seeing and hopefully see a lot more of is the very old fashioned um, way of picking up a phone to a consultant um, uh, or, or, or dropping them an email and saying, I'm a bit stuck. And um, the patient doesn't need to walk into an outpatient. It doesn't, they don't need to be referred to a hospital. Um, but also I can then say to the patient, well, I've, I've spoken to a consultant and we've talked about your case and I think we should be doing this and that. And that's just as productive for them as if they'd sort of waited for an outpatient appointment with everything that went with that. So the old fashioned picking up the phone and knowing your consultant, hopefully will come back into fashion very strongly. I agree with you, and I think the old-fashioned taking history and examining the patient bit, which you made the point earlier on, you need time to do that. This is not a disease that's going to be manageable in a six-minute six minute bounce. It's going to take, you know, for me to get into the meat of that would take me, I would imagine, a 40 or 50 minute consultation to be able to take a prop history and do an examination and know what tests to do. Uh, and your point was well made. Um, this health system is going to be under massive pressure for other reasons too. And we've got to have to work out a lean way of building systems that are efficacious and effective um, to manage these patients at all. We've got a few questions here that uh, I'd like to put to you all. Um, one question from Louise Newman is, what work's being done to ensure that women uh, with long COVID are definitely not perimenopausal or menopausal? There's no blood test for the perimenopause or menopause, and it's so... And the the men are so poorly managed already in women without long COVID. I'm concerned that the NHS long COVID, uh, whoopsie, I'm losing this, uh, the, the uh, NHS long COVID clinics will be flooded with perimenopausal and menopausal women who should be treated appropriately for these symptoms related to their low, low, low hormone levels, irrespective of their long COVID status. Does anyone like to comment on that? Roger. Oh, Steph, Steph put a hand up. Oh, okay. Um, so I think, so as someone who teaches women's health to GPs and teaches them about menopause, um, I menopause is, and perimenopause is, is very poorly understood before this. 
um, I think what Hugh said about taking a history and listening to the patient is about the most important thing you can do here. There isn't a blood test for menopause or perimenopause. And um, Louise, I, I'm happy to share this, Louise pointed out to me with my long COVID that that might be the problem <laughs> um, because Louise knows me. And until, and I'm an expert in menopause um, and I had twigged that um, that might be part of the problem and starting HRT has made a big difference. It hasn't got rid of all of it, um, but it has it has helped, particularly with the brain fog, um, interestingly, um, and a bit of the the, the um, fatigue. So it's really it's really up to GPs to take a good history, listen, be aware that these two things are happening to people who are often in that same demographic, um, and try HRT. Don't, don't do blood tests. We know that they're rubbish. Try the HRT as long as there's no sort of significant contraindications because it may make a significant difference. And, um, and Louise is spot on, actually, and I'm very grateful to her. And I, and I think it's important that GPs actually know that piece of, of clinical information. I like to think I'm a pretty switched on kind of guy with a finger on the pulse. I wasn't aware of that until a couple of weeks ago. And again, it was Louise that brought that uh, to, to, to my attention. And so I think we are patient information, uh, sorry, GP information um, on, on a regularly updated basis. However, we get our sources from is going to be absolutely crucial. I mean, NICE have got guidelines out. They're okay. They work the way they expect NICE guidelines to be. Um, but there's an awful lot of cracks that patients can fall between if you just go by those guidelines. And they'll continue to evolve as time goes by. So there has to be a way where primary care physicians and general staff um, are kept updated as to the um, developments in long COVID, which are going to be rolling off our, our sheets every week. It's going to be constantly changing. We're finding about this, uh, about this on a weekly basis. I agree, Roger. I just pick up on that. You make a really good point about listening to the patients here, because I think in the first state, the answers are going to come from the patients, just as the reports of the disease did. Um, just as we've heard um, that the reports of menstrual cycle disorders were largely ignored. I mean, women couldn't get to see the GPs or hospital doctors. If they did, they were told, well, you've been poorly. It's probably just that. Uh, but the bigger community were able to get together and say, no, there is a something going on here. And I'll give you one anecdote about this, um, which is a professor or colleague of mine who Nick will know, we were all at medical school together, who got COVID in February, very early case. That's being a jet setting professor for you. And he phoned me up and said, um, Hugh, are you seeing fungal infections? And I said, yeah, we're seeing a lot of them on the wards, the ITU patients, definitely with COVID. He's, I said, why? He said, because my athlete's foot is now trying to consume my legs from my toes to my groin. I'm having to get systemic fluconazole. And I just wanted to flag that it was going on. Now, no one had mentioned that in the community before. I spoke with him the other day and said, how's the long COVID? Because he's affected by it. He's had this cyclical business. Every six weeks, he's written off for a week and then it seems to surface and I spoke to him the other day and said have you had the vaccine he said yeah I have and I said well, how's that been he said well peculiarly big reaction to it but I've noticed that my long Covid symptoms seem to have got dramatically better now that's an N of one we do have to start listening to those ends of one and we have capacity to do that now with social media and Twitter and Facebook and so forth and I think this is where I'm going to be watching for the clues as to how to investigate and manage these things now, because I think the patients will be ahead of us. Can I move you to another area? One, one that interests me and, and, and concerns a lot of patients who have that, and, and this is the autonomic nervous problem. And there's a question from David Mummery, which is what do you think of the idea of central sensitization of the autonomic nervous system by the hyperinflammatory immune response and dysregulation of the of the HPA axis being the cause of some of the more CFS or fibromyalgia type symptoms. Well I can I'm not an expert I read the papers uh, and in fact I was reading one this morning a, a paper that came out uh, just last month on this it's speculative I mean there are cases of POTS out there that looks fairly clear there are people who seem to have autonomic dysfunction but the review article um, was unclear about the prevalence and also how it's mediated I think we are all seeing people with uh, evidence of hypothalamic and autonomic dysfunctions people running low temperatures actually as well as just high 
Um, so I think it's there. I don't know very much more about it than that. I think it's certainly possible. The brain effects have been, as you know, classified into sort of three groups. There's the direct sort of neurotropic and damaging effects of the virus directly. Uh, then there's the inflammatory responses related to it. And then there's some of the other effects, the sort of uh, neurovascular uh, phenomena as well. Um, but I don't know where that fits in. In fact, Stephanie, you probably know far more about that than I do. Uh, there's just not a, a lot of evidence out there yet, but there, there needs to be. And uh, it could be found out quite easily, actually. Um, there's a question from Vasiliki Kavalis, uh, and that is it, it appears that exertional dyspnea is a frequent and disabling symptom for long COVID patients. What would be the intervention? What would the intervention be for patients with this symptom? And I think we've all have people who have real problems with this. I, well, I'll, I'll chip straight into that. I think Peter will want to speak, and so will the others too, because I think we'll echo ourselves. I'm really scared about this sort of issue because I don't think there is a treatment for it. I think you need to know what the cause is. Um, and one of my colleagues indeed was off with long COVID with persistent breathlessness, saw colleagues repeatedly who said, well, there you are, graded exercise. And when we see TPA, she pretty much occluded her proximal pulmonary arteries on both sides. I mean, it was, it was near lethal. So there are people out there who will have big proximal thrombosis. We see that commonly in hospitalized patients. The microvascular thrombosis is there. We know that um, the dead spaces can change. We know there can be progressive fibrosis. There's boop out there, which is still responsive or not. There are a whole raft of different things. And, and Petter might want to talk with this because they're talking about the dual energy scans. Um, unless you really think about the cause of the breathlessness and find out what the cause is, you won't get an effective treatment. That's the problem. It, it's going to take a lot of unpicking. But Petter might have a view as to what the first test should be if it's thought to be pulmonary. Yeah, so that's a good, uh, for sure. In our multidisciplinary clinic here, where we've seen about 300 patients with non-hospitalized acute COVID, so mild uh, acute illness and then long-term symptoms, mostly women, mostly young, several previous athletes, uh, such as marathon runners and other things. Um, uh, when they've been put through a dual, C dual energy CT scan, there's a clear mismatch between perfusion and ventilation in the lungs. And, and they, the pulmonologists tell me that they think this is another uh, presentation of the dysautonomia, that um, there is a related phenomenon to the pulse without having necessarily the tachycardia. Some patients have both. Um, and so we're investigating autoantibodies in these instances, looking at antibodies to uh, G-protein coupled receptors and other things um, to try to understand the mechanisms here. But there's a clear pathology, sure. I mean, keeping with Peter's point, or Petter's point, of course, in intensive care patients, it's misunderstood. I mean, the hypoxia is largely a vascular phenomenon. In the early phases of ventilating patients, they've got very compliant lungs. It's not difficult at all to get large volumes in. In fact, it, you try very hard not to get large volumes in. These lungs are soft and easily inflated. The hypoxia is, is a vascular and a VQ matching problem. Um, it can then become a problem with fibrosis and late ARDS. It can become a problem with an open pulmonary uh, PFO because of pulmonary hypertension. We come a lot of other things later, but it's interesting that P Petter is commenting on this VQ mismatch late because of course that's what we see early. I've got a Henderson hypothesis here, and my N is zero rather than one, which is that um, in the next three to five years, we're going to see a very significant statistical spike in the increase in COPD patients who are previously fit and well, who are non-smokers, who had significant COVID and were ventilated. Um, I, th I think that the, um, the, the evidence of the scarring and the inflammatory uh, response uh, that they've had um, probably will have a long-term impact to the point of COPD symptoms long-term. I hope I'm too wrong, uh, and I've got no evidence for that. It's just my hunch. Well, your, your evidence, you know, again, your hunch would be right if you look at any other form of acute lung inflammation that's bad enough to get ventilated. So the acute respiratory or adult respiratory distress syndrome patients that have been followed up in the States mainly, um, you've still got significant functional impairment of the patient at five years. Um, some of that is pulmonary, but a lot of it actually is probably muscular as well, which brings us back to this issue that mitochondria may well be playing a role here. Uh, one of my colleagues actually had COVID in March and has long COVID, and she was a, a sort of national standard skier 
and climber and she finds that she can't even show, hold the shower head over her head anymore because her muscles ache so much. And that's also associated with breathlessness. So I guess it brings us back to where we started, mm. which is that we don't really know what this is, um, but we're gonna have to find out pretty quickly. And I'm not, well, there are now studies going on, a couple of grants have gone out. So maybe in the coming months, we will know. There's a question from Liz Miller to all the panelists is, where does obesity fit into the picture of COVID and long COVID? Well, I can do the first bit. I haven't got a clue about long COVID. Um, we we know obesity is it, it, it um, obesity is more prevalent in people with hospitalised COVID and on intensive care units. It's hard to differentiate whether that's due to the effects of obesity, for instance, on insulin resistance or coronary vascular disease or hypertension, all the other things that go with it, or high cholesterol. Because remember, the coronavirus, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, does get into cells not just using ACE2, it is actually transported in using cholesterol. It, it, it jumps into cholesterol and gets taken in that way as well. Um, or whether it's a feature of um, some of the racial demographics, so the Southeast Asian, particularly men, are more prone to central obesity, or whether it's a function that goes also with deprivation, because bear in mind that half the patients in intensive care are in the lowest two, quintile, uh, the lowest two quintiles of deprivation. So it's hard to know how much is cause, um, but it's certainly a very strong association. And I have a sore back from proning patients who are heavy as a result. I would, have add, uh, sorry, I would add an immune, immune system perspective as well, because we know that uh, obese individuals have a persistent inflammatory response prior to the infection. And we do believe from other instances as well, such as particular some specific immunodeficiencies associated with inflammation, that they tend to have a severe acute COVID. Uh, from my experience, when it comes to long, uh, long-term uh, COVID, those are predominantly healthy, but tend to be younger females and sort of younger middle age and very many times very fit and athletic before the disease hits. Yeah, that's a point worth picking up, Peter. In fact, I'd be interested in your well, what do you think about that? Someone was asking me the other day, are we seeing these young, fit, athletic people with really severe fatigue because they started with very high oxidative phosphorylative capacity, for instance, and their mitochondria take a bigger hit? Or is it because they're so much more attuned to their bodies and what normal function is for them? Do you have a view on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm working a little bit with the Swedish Olympic Committee and their athletes, and several of them have been suffering from this. And so I, they have obviously a huge shift in physical capacity, and so it's very notable for them. Um, there is a hypothesis, which I have no idea whether it's true or not, that persistent minor injuries to your muscles would make you more prone to some of these autoimmune events. Um, that is a complete hand-waving you know, speculation at this point, but still worth thinking about. There's uh, a lot of discussion which you've all been looking at about whether we can use artificial intelligence uh, to make use or make sense of all of the data that's coming, coming in. Uh, Petty, you've commented on this. W would you like to start by telling us whether sure. you think that this could be useful? So we use, in my lab, when we generate lots of data on the immune system across all the different white blood cell types and hundreds or thousands of proteins and all the genes and so on, we use machine learning all the time. However, the problem is if you want to make predictive algorithms, you need lots of data. Yeah. And we have no way near that number of individuals studied or the type of data uh, sets that would help us in this way at the moment. Uh, we might get in the future, but we're nowhere near it in my opinion. But is there some way we could maximize the input of data from multiple centers to make this useful? Well, potentially, yes. And I do think this multidisciplinary approach is looking at imaging across the different organs defected, immune system profiles, whole genome sequencing, all of these things would obviously give you lots of data. Um, the only question is whether you have enough individuals studied using all these modalities that you can actually do you know, make some predictions. I, I, I doubt it. I think it will be a long ways ahead. Does anybody else want to comment on this? Well, you just give me ideas, um, Stafford, it, because I agree totally with everything Petter said and everything that you've said. Um, AI and ML can make huge differences if it's got a large enough data set to, and then another one to do the validation on. Um, 
we have trouble linking up even NHS hospitals with data. There aren't complete phenotypes going on. Um, so we're always going to end up getting this patchwork of little bits of this and that here and there. And it'll be very hard to create those data sets. But what you're making me wonder about is actually whether or not there isn't a patient driven way of doing this. Mm. Um, there was an outfit called Patients Like Me in the States some years ago, uh, founded by Jamie Hayward, whose brother sadly got Lou Gehrig's disease. And they decided to try and find a cure quickly before he died. And they failed to do it. But what they did do was get large numbers, hundreds of thousands of patients with conditions like that or MS to volunteer to give omics of everything and to provide all their patient information and data and indeed to provide money to support the work that went on. And that was for a for-profit company because they knew that the data might come up with a cure for them. And I'm already just wondering how many people out there would gift the omics, uh, the bloods, the urines, the patient data and so forth to someone like PETA with the $20 to help with the cost funding of the analysis. And maybe that's another way of, of, of doing it at scale is, is sort of crowd sourcing and crowdfunding the data. But uh, anyway, that was a purely speculative thought. Could you make use of data like that, Peter? Uh, potentially, yes, if it's uh, sufficient numbers of patients, yeah, of course. Because uh, otherwise it's going to be really quite difficult to early on to get the experience we need to be able to answer that type of question. I would also like to add that we can use uh, data from other patient groups, you know, I mean, we can use this is not entirely new, right? We see post-infectious disorders all the time. It's just that every now and right now, so many people are getting a primary infection with a new bug. But um, it's nothing entirely new. And so we could use, you know, repositories of sepsis patients or flu patients or MECFS patients and other things as well. Well, I, uh, are there any other things that the panel particularly wants to discuss, uh, things that you feel that we've left out? Because uh, if not, I, I would just like now to introduce one other panel member uh, who uh, we haven't brought in yet. And, sorry, and this is... Sorry, yeah. Prof. Uh, since you just gave the opportunity, I just wanted yeah, to ask, of course. ask the panel about uh, the data on um, <clears throat> the emerging data uh, on vitamin D supplementation. Um, there's been a number of papers recently. Uh, it's been in the public domain. Um, Whilst you do that, could we add colchicine as well? And, uh, recently <laughs> colchicine as well, yeah. yeah. Um, Peter, we'll have a view. Uh, well, go first, Peter. Yeah, well, I, I would say that um, obviously uh, if, you're, if you're low vitamin D, uh, you should supplement, um, and that would maybe have an effect on your immune response to the virus. Uh, when it comes to colchicine, and I, I would say yes, but uh, we already have dexamethasone, which gives a very strong, uh, you know, beneficial effect uh, early on, or, you know, preventing the cytokine storm. And I think colchicine might add a little bit to that. But um, I don't think these micronutrient, uh, you know, deficiencies are going to explain that much in the entire story, to be honest. I think it's, you know, small, small, small changes. I agree. So, I mean, vitamin D has all these immunomodulatory effects. Um, I, I'm, I've yet to be convinced by the vitamin D story. The trials, proper trials are going on. Um, if you measure vitamin D in most of these patients, they're going to be low. We've done that for years and have given up doing it. They're always low in any patient if it's a critical care unit. And most people who come into hospital. And every, most people who don't come into hospital. Well, indeed. And most people <laughs> who don't come into hospital. Um, and it's lower in people who are in the risk factor groups of which we've spoken. So I don't think there's evidence yet of a causal association. So I stick with Petter's view, which is if you're low in something, it might be good for you. There's no harm in taking it. The Colchison story was still waiting for the other two big trials to come out. The, the Canadian study uh, didn't really stand up in its early treatment site. It was small numbers and no one has jumped yet to start treating patients with Colchison in primary care. Otherwise, I guess we're going to have an epidemic of diarrhea and renal failure. <laughs> so I would hang fire personally. Good. Glad you said that. OK, well, at this point, I will uh, introduce our final uh, panel member. And our final pan 
panel member is Michael Rosen. And, and Michael actually did attend Middlesex Hospital Medical School for a year, but very sensibly, uh, he quickly transferred to Wadham College, Oxford to read English. And he's absolutely renowned. Most uh, people will know him for his work as a poet, performer, broadcaster, and script writer. And he's one of the best known figures in the children's book world. And Michael got really bad COVID and now has long COVID. Uh, and, but he's doing extremely well and has very kindly agreed to read one of his poems for us to finish off this webinar. Michael. Thank you very much, Stafford. Thank you. Um, and the poem I was going to read is a tribute to all of you um, and to all, all people working in the health, the health biz. And it's the poem that I wrote as a tribute to the NHS on its 60th birthday, um, and it goes like this. These are the hands that touch us first. Feel your head, find the pulse, and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the grip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, Flick the switch, soothe the saw, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes and carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose and touch us, touch us last. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much indeed. That is a great way for us to end this webinar. And all it leads me to do now is to turn over to uh, Nick Morris, who's going to close the session. Thank, thank, every, thank everybody for, for joining us tonight. Uh, Petter, thank you for coming from Stockholm, letting us interrupt your family time on a Friday evening because we all know how important family time is. Stephanie, I thought you were remarkable, rushing from your clinic and making it in time. Michael, when you first read that poem on, on, on Newsnight, I rang up Stafford the next day and it was my dream to always have you on one of these webinars, so that's wonderful. Hugh, you've not changed in over 30 years, so it's been brilliant having you here. And Roger, it's always great hearing your staccato way of looking at things, which is great. Um, look, we've had a great audience tonight. Now, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us tonight. I know we had visitors from other countries, from Turkey. I recognise two people who've joined us from there. Um, I'd like to thank Sanjeev for all his help in helping me put this together with Stafford. Stafford, it goes without saying, we can't do this without your unflappable nature, uh, the way you think about the problems and the issues and the thought that you the thought you put into to the way you interview all our wonderful panelists. But we couldn't do anything without Claire and Robert from IPS, who over the last two months have been absolutely wonderful to work with. They totally <clears throat> believe in what we're doing at Sapien Care. So on behalf of Stafford, me and Sanjeev, I'd like to thank Claire and Robert for the help at IPS. If I was better technically, I'd put up a picture of their, of, of, of their information, but maybe I'll be able to do that next time. So finally, I'd like to wish you a very pleasant and good weekend. And as a gynaecologist, I totally believe in oestrogen. I think oestrogen works on the SERP pathway. I think we've ignored the SERP pathway. And we haven't spoken about metformin today, but that's for another day. So thank you all. Have a great weekend. Um, in terms of catch up, you'll be able, it, this will be this will be up on our website on Monday or Tuesday. So if you want to watch again, it will be there and other people will be able to log in and have a look then. So thank you all for joining us. Have a very good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.